Welcome to a tale of three presidential homes, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Please welcome Richard Reich, director of the Heritage Foundation's B. Kenneth Simon Center for American Studies. Well, thank you for coming to our panel this morning. Uh, entitled A Tale of Three Presidential Homes, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Our panel today will discuss how identity politics and anti-racist ideology have infected the presidential homes in Virginia, and also what this movement aims to do to our nation's cherished ideals. But this corruption of history has deep roots in the progressive left's collective mind, and the aggressive nature of this ideology will not stop in presidential homes or in our nation's educational institutions, for that matter. In the words of political theorist Joshua Mitchell, the confrontation with identity politics is the supreme battle of our time for those who would defend American principles and our constitutional order. So to sharpen our thinking on this score, we have assembled an excellent panel who I will invite to come on stage now. Bill Allen is Emeritus Dean and Professor at Michigan State University. He is a Senior Visiting Scholar at the University of Colorado's Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization, and he is a tremendous scholar of the American founding and the author of numerous books and essays. Most recently, he's the editor of The State of Black America, published in May by Encounter Books. Sam Gregg is Distinguished Fellow in Political Economy at the American Institute for Economic Research, and he is a visiting fellow in the Simon Center for American Studies at the Heritage Foundation, as well as an affiliated scholar with the Acton Institute, a senior writer for Law and Liberty. He is widely published in political economy, economic history, monetary theory, and the author of numerous books, many of which have won awards, including most recently, The Essential Natural Law. And his new book, The Next American Economy, Nation, State, and Markets in an Uncertain World, will be published this fall by Encounter. My colleague, Brenda Hafera, is Assistant Director and Senior Policy Analyst in the Simon Center for American Studies, and she is the catalyst for our panel today with her new study, A Tale of Three Presidential Houses, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, just published by Heritage. And Peter Wood is the President of the National Association of Scholars. Dr. Wood is the author of 1620, A Critical Response to the 1619 Project, a Bee in the Mouth, Anger in America Now, and the book Diversity, The Invention of a Concept, as well as numerous essays and reviews. Thank you all so much for joining us. So Brenda, I will turn to you first. Um, you authored this report. You have given us the details uh, at these three presidential homes of our great Virginians. Uh, tell us about the state of play at these homes, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and what's driving this. Yes, so you would think that when you go to these homes, you would learn a great deal about these three exceptional Americans. And unfortunately, that is not always the case. The title of the report is The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, because in this assessment, Mount Vernon is the good, Monticello is the bad, and Montpelier is unfortunately the ugly. Overall, visitors do learn a great deal about George Washington when they go to Mount Vernon. There is an entire museum and education center dedicated to George Washington, which takes them through the Constitutional Convention, the French and Indian War, the Revolutionary War, George Washington's presidency, among other accomplishments. During the house tour, guides talk about George Washington, the enslaved people who lived there, and the contents of the mansion. And then the Mount Vernon Ladies Association also maintains a memorial to the enslaved people, as well as the tombs of George Washington and Martha Washington. Overall, they have incorporated the story of slavery into the story of Mount Vernon, while paying careful attention 
to George Washington's accomplishments. Monticello, unfortunately, does not measure up to this standard. The main tours, there are a great deal of tours at Monticello, but they include a two and a half hour long tour on from slavery to freedom, a 45 minute tour of the house, a 45 minute tour of slavery and garden tours. The house tour is the most popular tour and guides talk about the contents and inventions in the mansion, some of Jefferson's accomplishments, slavery, and Jefferson's time in France, which is a way of introducing the story of Sally Hemings. Monticello has chosen to convey the story without qualification rather than a controversy over which historians disagree. The exhibits at Monticello include exhibits in the cellars on the enslaved people, the families and individuals who live there, the purpose of those rooms, the reconstructed quarters along Mulberry Row, and exhibits at the base of the mountain on the building of Monticello and Thomas Jefferson as a scientist and architect. Much of this was made possible through a donation by philanthropist David Rubenstein. Overall, at Monticello, there are no exhibits dedicated to Thomas Jefferson as president, as vice president, secretary of state, as minister to France, there is not a lot of time dedicated to his accomplishments. While they are sometimes men mentioned in passing, I would not say that that is the dominant focus at Monticello. There is a, a short video on Thomas Jefferson and Monticello and slavery. Unfortunately, Montpelier is the worst of these three offenders. So it seems that Montpelier has adopted a critical race theory narrative and that the Southern Poverty Law Center was very influential in the framing of the exhibits at Montpelier. Unfortunately, there are no exhibits currently dedicated to James Madison himself. James Madison was our fourth president. He was the father of the Constitution, the primary author of the Bill of Rights, and wrote many of the Federalist Papers, which ensured the passing of the Constitution. These are only mentioned in passing during the house tour and a brief video in the visitor center. The dominant focus now at Montpelier is the near <coughs> distinction of color exhibits, which includes a series of exhibits on slavery in the cellars and the reconstructed quarters in the south yard. The single exhibit on the Constitution does not focus on James Madison's role in shaping that document, or the remarkableness of the Constitution, which to date is the oldest written Constitution in the world. It focuses on slavery. And another portion of the sellers is a contemporary video on slavery's lasting legacies, which contends that there are probably more defeats in pursuit of justice and fairness and equality in American history than there are moments of triumph. So it seems there were two associates of the SPLC who were featured in those videos. Multiple lines from that video echoes the SPLC curriculum. All eight of the children's books that are featured in a supplementary exhibit for children on teaching children about race and slavery were recommended by the SPLC. So they seem to have a great deal of influence at Montpelier. So that is the state of play at these three presidential homes. And it is rather unfortunate because preserving these institutions carries with it the special dispensation of preserving the legacy of these three founders. And when Thomas Jefferson was at the end of his life, he wrote to Madison and said, take care of me when dead. This is something that now falls to the American people and we must fight to take back these historic sites. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Bill, you know, Brenda has been talking about sort of the, you know, the takeover uh, of two of these homes. Help us think deeply about the anti-racist ideology, the identity politics themes mm -hmm. present, and what that means for the American founding. It seems to me what they mean to do to the American founding. You know, progressives have told us since their inception in America that we're an ill-founded country. Mm -hmm. Of course, the 1619 Project and anti-racism, 
it ups the ante dramatically by saying, you know, we are built on slavery, we are built on racism, our, we have a slave owner's constitution. So help us think about what's at stake here. Well, let me first of all just observe what a wonderful thing this is that uh, Heritage and Brenda have done. I think it's important to draw attention to these dynamics at the present time because what we're witnessing, as I see it, is an attempt to colonize culture in the United States from an alien perspective, really. Uh, some more than 40 years ago when I served on the Commission on Civil Rights, I praised highly of Morris Dees, who founded the Southern Poverty Law Center. And I did so because he began a work that was important, valuable, and made an, a contribution to strengthen this society. But what has happened at the SPLC in the short time frame of recent history has been the colonization of the SPLC by an alien ideology and approach. So it is no longer what Morris Dees founded. And I mention that in order to illustrate what in the larger frame is being attempted with regard to US history and culture. So just as it has been taken over at SPLC, now the effort is to expand and take over uh, our understanding of American culture in order to remake our history. So a very short story will put this in perspective, and then we will be able to understand how to appreciate what the anti-racism campaign is about. I, I want to introduce you to Stephen Hopkins. Now, Stephen Hopkins was governor of Rhode Island, who also uh, served in the Second Continental Congress and signed the Declaration of Independence. He was a governor of Rhode Island who moved from Massachusetts who happened to have acquired a slaves, a handful, three or four slaves. But at the time of the Declaration of Independence and shortly before that, in the midst of this growing consciousness of the wrongfulness of slavery, Hopkins came to the conviction that he shouldn't hold slaves and freed his slaves. Uh, Hopkins, who still has descendants, of course, alive in the United States, represents, therefore, one stream of development at the time of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. A, a, a dawning awareness of the wrongfulness of slavery was part of the picture. And what makes that of interest to us particularly is that Hopkins in the Constitutional, uh, pardon me, in the uh, Second Continental Congress in 1775-76 uh, was the third generation Hopkins in the United States and North America. The first Stephen Hopkins arrived in 1609 and was at Jamestown. And in that Jamestown settlement, <laughs> whose, of course, fate we are all aware of, uh, he managed to escape by a quirk of history. Uh, at Jamestown, he, how shall I put this, he incurred a sentence of death for prosecution because he had become restive about the manner in which those aristocratic adventurers were trying to force the Indios into performing the labor of the settlement, which they wouldn't do. And the only reason his sentence of death, because he spoke out against this, was commuted, was that he was the only one who was doing any work, and they were utterly dependent on him. <laughs> and by that single chance, when his wife died in London and he had to return to take care of his orphan children, he escaped the destruction at uh, Jamestown. But he returned in 1619. He returned on the Mayflower. He was part of that small band dedicated to forming a civil society based on the principle of consent. He got into trouble in Massachusetts also. Uh, that is because he opened a public house there. And in running that public house, he was willing to receive all comers, uh, which uh, attracted the attention of the powers that be that reprimanded him and happily did not prosecute him for being so indiscriminate in his reception of persons into his public house. My point is this. We see at the origins of the country there is more than one strain. There were, of course, the handful of people who brought slaves on the Mayflower, but there was also Stephen Hopkins. Uh, there was, in the course of development, the later Stephen Hopkins, who, in the burgeoning growth of slavery in the United States, for a time fell prey to that practice, but also recovered from it. So that there were, and are now descendants of Hopkins who reflect the tradition of the original Stephen Hopkins as well as people who came with slaves. The attempt to redefine the United States as only a slaveholding society 
is therefore false to the facts, the history and the culture. And that attempt can only succeed insofar as the attempt to colonize the culture succeeds, i.e. to take over the role of interpretation and to control the narrative, as they now like to say. So that's the period we're living in, and that's what's happening in these presidential homes and in many other historical associations, driven through, through extensive networks and processes of development, uh, through museum studies even, and through uh, regional humanities associations and many others. They're all working in a concatenate fashion to construct a concept of the United States that will reshape what we conceive of our culture to be. Sam, another dimension to this is the economic dimension, and to change the way we think uh, about the history of, of you know, the American economy, of the American free market, and the insistence of a number of new histories, this was a part of the 1619 Project as well, uh, that the American economy is bound up with slavery, that it's predatory, and that it's anything but voluntary, and this is a, a part of the story of the wealth of America. Help us think more about this critique and where it goes wrong. Well, it goes wrong in many ways, and I think that <clears throat> what Brenda's analysis documents and what Professor Allen has really, I think, shown very well is the way in which what's happening at the presidential homes reflects a broader attempt to completely, I like the word colonize, co colonize American history. And we see this particularly with regard to the 1619 Project, but that also reflects a broader argument that's been going on for a while about slavery and its significance for the emergence of American uh, capitalism. So there's one school of thought called the, uh, the New History of Capitalism, the title sort of gives it away, I think, which has been much popularized by the 1619 Project, and it argues that slavery in general and the cotton industry associated with that in particular was what really drove the emergence of what is the strongest economy in the world today. Uh, and in fact, my colleague at the American Institute for Economic Research, Phil Magnus, he's done yeoman's work, I think, in demolishing that thesis in his book, 1619 Project, A Critique. And back in January 2021, Heritage published a paper of my own on this particular topic. And I argued that the 1619 Project's um, account of American capitalism reflects factual errors, very ambiguous ide uh, ideologies of ideas, and draws very heavily on this one very contested school of thinking about the economic history of the United States. And of course, uh, the reality is that slavery and the cotton industry that was associated with that, it played a relatively minor role in the emergence of the American economy. Now, that's not to justify it, that's not to minimize the horrors of slavery or anything like that. But actually, if you look at the economics of slavery, it's a fair amount of evidence to suggest that it actually damaged the emergence of the American economy and particularly damaged the southern states in which it was obviously most prevalent. Now, I want to be clear. Slavery made many plantation owners extremely wealthy. We shouldn't play that down. That's, that's absolutely true. Um, <clears throat> but it's also the case that the emergence of the cotton industry, which was driven by what, what some people call the financialization of slavery, whereby slaves be, slave owning becomes a very valuable source of capital. Slave owners would basically raise mortgages on this, and this is how they expanded the cotton industry, so much so that they reduced the South to basically a one-crop plantation, which, as any economist will tell you, is usually a disaster in the long term for any set of economic arrangements. But here's the crucial point. The cotton boom, which really took off around about 1800, it certainly was a boom, but it had a much smaller impact on the American economy than most people realize. So in 1860, cotton production represented somewhere between 5 and 6% of America's economy. Now, the new history of uh, capitalism, people will tell you it's much bigger, but that's simply not true. It's about 5 to 6%. Again not to minimize the terrible nature of what was going on, but it's very important to keep this all in perspective. Uh, and what happens, of course, in the South as a consequence of moving in this one crop production direction was that it enabled the emergence of what, what we would call today a type of crony arrangements whereby 
Slaveholders would basically move from part of the country to each other, essentially um, going to the riverbanks, uh, heavily um, exploiting these, these parts of the riverbank, using up all the good soil, and then moving on. It's like a predatory type of economic set of arrangements. But here's the thing. Um, we also know that slavery wasn't essential in terms of the emergence and the long-term productivity of cotton in the United States. We know this because um, cotton production collapsed, more or less, with the beginning of the Civil War, right? So uh, the South was unable, in some cases, unwilling to export cotton. So the amount of cotton being produced went from something like 1.8 billion to something like 28 million bales. That's a huge decrease. But after the Civil War, slavery is abolished, right? we suddenly see cotton production take off again without slavery being part of the picture. So in that sense, what we see, I think, is that, yes, slavery is part of the emergence of the cotton industry, but it's also the case that the cotton industry was not in itself completely dependent upon this particular institution. And we also see that in the long term, it retarded the economic development of the South, so much so that... Um, People living in the South in 1860 were actually poorer per GDP per capita than they were in 1800. So slavery certainly benefits a small group of plantation owners who are very well connected to government circles, sort of what we would call crony capitalists today. But it impoverished the overall South, including obviously lots of poor whites as well. Um, the good thing I think that comes out of this is that in the end, it was industrial capitalism in the North that gave the North the military strength to crush the South, to defeat the Confederacy, and thereby get rid of the institution of slavery. So in the end, slavery in the cotton industry made the South much weaker and much less able to defend itself militarily when it came to the Civil War and the ultimate triumph of the North was in its economic strength, which the South didn't have precisely because they went down this path of embracing slavery and moving in this direction of a one industry type of economy. So I think these are all very helpful correctives when it comes to understanding the institution of slavery, the role that it played in Southern economies. And it's very important to contest the type of narrative that we hear today about the role that slavery played in the South and in the emergence of capitalism as a whole. And I think that's very important because it plays into what we're talking about here, which is, I like this expression, the colonization of American history by, I think the expression is exactly right, foreign ideologies. Thank you. Peter Wood, you have uh, written uh, a, a book-length response to the 1619 Project. You've thought a lot about this ideology. I think we've had, uh, our panelists have talked about sort of the motivation of what they're trying to do, but help us understand like the essence and where did the 1619 Project and what is it building on historically to, to even make these claims? Well, historically, it is true that um, slaves were brought to Jamestown, Virginia in August of 1619. They were brought by a pirate ship, the White Lion. Um, at the time, Jamestown didn't recognize the institution of slavery, so they turned their slaves into indentured servants, and they were shortly after that emancipated. Uh, the institution of slavery as we know it came somewhat later in the 17th century uh, in the English colonies. Where does all this come from? Well, it's been known by historians for hundreds of years that that the facts that I just recited are true. Um, Nicole Hannah-Jones, taking advantage of the coincidence of the calendar in 2019, said 400 years of slavery constitutes basically the entire history of the United States. The uh, slavery becomes, in her uh, view, this uh, a microscope to which every aspect of American history can be uh, re-examined with the result that we see that uh, uh, the pursuit of power by a relatively prosperous white majority was uh, sufficient to compromise every value put forward by Americans. These were false when they were written, she writes. 
Well, Nicole Hannah Jones is not that original thinker. There had been others who had been promoting this kind of interpretation as far back as the 1930s. The American Communist Party had a fairly large role in developing that narrative. Um, uh, one of the, the first to give some of the phrases to it uh, was um, Angela Davis in the 1970s. Uh, so there is a there's a prehistory to the 1619 project in which a radicalized fringe um, of American dissidents were putting forward these claims. They never really got any traction, although one can find a, ha a shelf full of books in which similar uh, ideas are put forward. What happens with the 1619 project is that the the power of the New York Times comes into play. The last page of the original New York Times magazine on which this thing was published was an announcement by the Pulitzer Center that it was going to be rolled out as a curriculum in the nation's schools. And uh, by the time the announcement was made, it was already happening. So we are now at the point where the 1619 Project and um, pieces of it that are labeled by other things, critical race theory or anti-racism, uh, the new abolitionism, there are about a dozen different names by which this goes by, are put forward as the accurate history of the American past. Um, the motives behind this are, uh, of course, somewhat murky, but in some cases clear. Nicole Hannah-Jones herself has been uh, precise in saying that what she wants is reparations, and that this is in her mind, a project aimed at persuading the American Congress to pass billions of dollars in reparations to the descendants of uh, people who were enslaved. Uh, that's a piece of it. I think one has to add elements that one would probably not acknowledge uh, as a progenitor of the project, but there's an element of intellectual vanity in this. When false claims are put forward, they're demonstrated to be false, but people refuse to change them. That's been part of the, the New York Times' approach. Uh, the 1619 Project itself ballooned into a 600-page book by the same title. Um, so we're now seeing this in the nation's curriculum. Uh, it has been uh, wrapped up closely by the Southern Poverty Law Center, which had already been promoting Howard Zinn's and the Zinn Project on along similar lines. Uh, Nicole, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones's uh, partner in some of this has been um, Ibram X. Kendi and his books on anti-racism. Uh, what comes of all of this, I would say, is uh, hatred for America, basically a, a, a fairly strong feeling that we're a rotten country from the start and that every American student needs to know that and to feel it. Um, this uh, dissension thus becomes an end in itself. That is, to be taught that a racial division is so fundamental to America that it will never disappear. Reparations need to be paid, but they will not expunge the guilt. Uh, Ibram X. Kendi teaches us that racism is so fundamental to America that we will be uh, living with it forever, and the only option is to engage in what he calls anti-racism, which is a kind of racism by uh, blacks against whites. Um, this is a, uh, a story of, uh, of envy, hatred, disgust, uh, being promoted as positive values that we should uh, reorient ourselves towards. Uh, none of this really makes sense if you're thinking of the United States as a place where civic education of learning how to be a uh, constructive member of a self-governing republic uh, is the goal of education. Instead, we're turning education, and here we go back to the, uh, the statues, the monuments, and the historic houses, all of which are avenues by which uh, historically, people have sought to understand who we were, to see ourselves through the lens of history, as well as understanding the, the structures of government and the kind of personal character that are necessary to maintain a free republic. Uh, 
All of those are now being compromised through a uh, definite systematic effort to teach us instead that uh, in, instead of history, we get this mythology. Uh, instead of government, we get an account of our institutions as being essentially pernicious. And instead of uh, trying to form good character of young people, we teach them that uh, hatred and dissension and dividing oneself against one's nations and one's fellow citizens are the, are the right path towards uh, power and independence. So the motives behind all this, um, well, I would have to say that on the whole, they are motives of uh, uh, putting the individual uh, into the category of uh, racial, cat into racial categories for the purpose of cultivating resentment. Thank you. Well, I want to turn now to the audience uh, to get your questions uh, for the panel. And um, uh, so, yeah, but just uh, Is this working? Okay. Um, my understanding was that the British, when they ended slavery in the 1830s, that a reparations was paid, not to the slaves, but to the slave owners who were deprived of the property by the state. So when we speak of reparations today about uh, that uh, the slaves should receive the reparations, uh, it seems totally um, distorted from what, where it should have been paid, <laughs> to me at least. Is that for a member of the panel or for the, uh, anyone? Just oh, okay, the sorry. sorry. Okay. Right. Well, the word reparations is now, I'd say, wholly owned by uh, the movement of the left that has taken it up as reparations for the descendants of slaves. The idea of um, reparations to past slave owners, I've read about only historically. I've never heard any contemporary person say that that was a good idea, and I think it rather it's not. But. Other questions? Uh, John? So this is a very important report. I think, Brenda, you've done a great job and really good public service. Uh, so we have other things going on in this country. So we're coming up on an anniversary of the Declaration of independence. And it seems when anybody, for instance, wants to talk about our Constitution, all they want to talk about is the revision that allowed uh, for the continued importation of slaves, although it frankly had a cutoff time at which that would end, which was not too far in the distance. And all they want to do is talk about the Three-Fifths Compromise, even though that had nothing to do with giving blacks uh, the opportunity to vote and everything to do with trying to provide extra electoral college votes uh, and congressional representatives to the slaveholding South. How do we begin to recapture this in, in anticipation of our celebration of the Declaration of Independence, uh, prevent the Southern Poverty Law Center and other groups of, of like-minded groups from capturing what should be a celebration uh, and turning it into another uh, chapter for the 1619 Project. I'd be happy to tackle that. Uh, that's part of the reason I introduced the Declaration of Independence through Stephen Hopkins in my opening remarks, because the question that's important is the question of what have we received by way of benefit, whether as individuals or as a society, for which we owe a proper gratitude and respect now. And we can certainly say of Hopkins that uh, he has descendants who can be properly thankful that he came to the moral awakening he came to. But that's not the end of the story. The people he freed also have descendants and can look back with thankfulness about the fact that he came to that moral awakening. And as I listened to Sam Gregg describing the circumstances surrounding the Civil War economically and the transition from slave-grown cotton to non-slave-grown cotton, I realized that what we see there is, of course, an echo of the private decision that Hopkins made being made on a social scale, i.e. the country came to a moral awakening. And those who are the descendants of the country that came to that moral awakening have reason to be grateful. 
have reason to show respect. So that the picture is much more complicated than the uh, one-dimensional portrait we're often asked to contemplate. The reality is that the founding period was a period that decisively put in motion a resistance to the ethic of slavery, if not an attempt to overcome the practice of slavery immediately. And you refer, of course, to the provision to end the slave trade in 20 years after the ratification of the Constitution. But we mustn't forget that when that finally came to be in 1807, when the legislation was introduced and then signed at the beginning of 1808, it also launched a controversy. Not a controversy over whether this trade should be ended, but what do you do if people violate the law and bring in the contraband? And the country discovered in that moment the very thing that we're all now talking about that is the continuing source of dispute among us, i.e., the uh, original draft of the legislation, and the Secretary of State drafted it, and of course the President was the one who was to sign it, uh, assumed ordinary legal boilerplate that a contraband would be sold in the interest of the government. Well, of course, the contraband in this case would be human beings. And if you're giving testimony against property in men, it's very difficult to say that the government should, in fact, then assume that property and benefit from it through sale. And that same line of reasoning followed all the way up through Abraham Lincoln's consideration of the Confiscation Acts and the Emancipation Proclamation. Abraham Lincoln objected to the term contraband and was poised to veto the Second Confiscation Act for that reason, because it assigned property in men, and he wanted to avoid that moral stain. In other words, the country has been, from its origins, riven with a debate that always tended in one direction toward the rejection of the concept of property in men. So as we look back and we ask, what is owed to the past, the thing that is most decisively owed to the past is the moral awakening that produced the respect and the love, frankly, for freedom that we all now know. And, and if we talk reparations, compensation, whatever you want, we see the same dynamic in play, whether it's in the Jay Tree when Washington refused to satisfy the demands of the South of compensation for the slaves carried away during the Revolutionary War, or in the Treaty of Ghent, where uh, John, John Quincy Adams, as Secretary of State, was forced to relent because they, Madison, frankly, was prepared now to accept this obligation. But we also found at that time, through the period following the signing of the Treaty of Ghent, a way around actually affirming property in men. This is an ongoing situation which has been consistently answered in one way. We will not affirm property in men, however difficult it was to arrive at that answer. So, so you, you ask your question in the context in which you're asking us to unfold a live history, not a dead history. And, and when I refer to people trying to colonize our culture and colonize our history, they're really trying to escape from history. And the reality we have to face is there's never an escape from history. And it may be that there are some terrible things result from people who are trying to colonize it, as the Emperor Julian discovered when he tried to eliminate Christianity in Rome and Constantinople, he did succeed in ending the Roman Empire, but not in ending Christianity. Other members of the panel on this question? Well, isn't part of the, the whole point of this presidential home discussion is that the presidential homes are enormously symbolic in this discussion? And that's what I think the genius of Brenda's paper is, is it focuses upon places that were owned by people who were so important for the founding of the United States, the Constitution, etc. All three men were presidents. Uh, their record of achievement is, is amazing when you think about it. But when the symbols of where they live, where so many people go and visit, and one of the things that Brenda's report does is list the sheer numbers of people that go mm -hmm. every year. And if they're going to these places and they're hearing this um, uh, distorted history of the people who inhabited these places and the, 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 the very difficult history of slavery and they're not hearing about some of the things that Professor Allen talked about which is how the founding and the constitutional period represent a type of moral 
awakening as to the evil of slavery, if they're not hearing that, then I'm very worried about what things like the, the celebration of the Declaration of Independence are going to be like. So holding the line on these houses and also challenging, for example, the trustees of these institutions to explain what has happened to them, I think is a very important uh, point to make as we move closer and closer to this very important commemoration in American history. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm John Burlaw. The, I uh, work on financial policy at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, but I'm also the author of the St. Martin's Press book, George Washington Entrepreneur, about all of Washington's unique and innovative business ventures. Thank you so much for the panel. I have a question on constructive solutions, mostly on the presidential homes, which I agree are so important. I agree with what I believe was said at the beginning, that Mount Vernon is just so much better than some of these other homes in putting uh, history, accurate history and putting it in context. I've seen where its uh, president, as well as the historian Mary Thompson, will mention when they talk about slavery about how you know it was it was uh, existed throughout the world and what Washington and the other founders did to uh, uh, help end it. Um, but I'm wondering also if so that has something to do with Mount Vernon's incentive structure, given that it was private from the beginning, takes no government funding, and you know also is very entrepreneurial itself, like Washington was in reopening the whiskey distillery and actually selling products like Washington's whiskey. They don't want to give. It's like they don't want to give their brand a, an unnecessarily inaccurate uh, image. So they have the incentives. You know they have you know sort of capitalist incentives. So I'm wondering if we should pursue alternatives like for the other homes if they do receive federal funding and i admit i'm not familiar with it to take away that federal funding or maybe or maybe condition it and the other thing i'm wondering is if scholars like yourselves might organize visits uh to some of these other homes the the homes that are not as uh uh, you know, upstanding on, you know, upholding the, the history and just uh, politely challenge some of the guides when they uh, when they when they say some of these uh, inaccuracies or things without con context. I realize that would take an effort to organize, but is it worth uh, are either are either of those initiatives worth pursuing? I'll, I'll take that. Um, so in response to the question of were federal funds received, Montpelier received a federal grant for a supplementary children's exhibit to teach children about race and slavery. They also received state funding to, for special projects and to develop anti-racist curriculum for use in Virginia public schools. Monticello has received a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities for an exhibit on the Declaration which is wonderful, but the guides often claim that Jefferson did not mean all when he wrote all men are created equal. So there is some question over whether or not the content of that exhibit will be accurate. As far as solutions, I would offer two main buckets. One solution is what can we do about these homes now? And a couple solutions would be choose who to support Mount Vernon is doing a very good job right now, and we need to help them hold the line. So choose to go to Mount Vernon over some of these other places. Um, another advice would be if you do go, write an honest review of these places and indicate what you think they are doing well and what they are doing poorly in ways they could improve. The long term, I think the solution needs to be to recognize that this is a very broad project, and the word is vigilant. So the National Trust for Historic Preservation that owns Montpelier owns 27 historical sites along, around the country. They have almost $50 million in assets and have a grassroots activism arm. They give out grants to other historical sites. So there is a great deal of potential for this narrative to spread elsewhere. David Rubenstein, who gave $20 million to Monticello and $10 million to Montpelier for the Mere Distinction of Color exhibits, has also given $10 million to the Thomas Jefferson Memorial for new exhibits there. The anti-racist curriculum is coming down the pipeline. 
And as the Southern Poverty Law Center is infamous for mailing their curriculum directly to schools, and now those individuals sit on the board in an advisory council at Montpelier, they would have that strategy to get that curriculum directly to the schools without parental knowledge. So I think parents need to be vigilant in recognizing that this could come to their school. Heritage has a guide for how to identify critical race theory. We have put together a supplemental parental guide for this report for parents, if they are going to these sites, what they need to know in advance and what they can expect. So, but overall, I think this is part of a large project to tear down our history and that we need to continue to push back. Brenda, what about also making this political? In the sense of people who visit these sites, contacting the legislators, the governor of Virginia and others, and just saying, hey, do you know what's going on here? You know, uh, could you speak to this? You know, that sort of those sorts of uh, solutions also. Yeah, I, th I think that is of all. If we are going to counter these measures, we need to recognize that this battle is being waged on multiple fronts and need to meet it on multiple fronts. So if the National Trust has a grassroots effort and there have 27 historical sites across the country, then we need to respond in kind. Yeah, if I may supplement these observations, though, uh, it, as someone who's been visiting these sites for well over 50, five decades now, a little bit more, and who experienced a great deal of frustration at the hands of tour guides who present to the public as experts when they are usually far from, and, and as who's also felt the restraining hand of a wife saying, now this is not the place. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do want to emphasize that there's one level at which the retail experience shouldn't be confused with the organized assault on the culture. The retail experience is not going to change. Human beings are human beings, and guides are going to be recruited, and they're going to make terrible historical mistakes. Uh, because their uh, exposure to historical knowledge is, frankly, relatively thin. And we just need to acknowledge that and understand it's not part of a greater conspiracy. But the organized assault is a different question. And I think that's what Brenda's done such a wonderful job of bringing our attention to. That you can respond to um, institutionally, organizationally, politically, and otherwise. But that means reaching it at the level at which it's making its impact that the Rubensteins you can't do much about, they're going to spread their millions, but you can certainly encourage other people to spread their millions too. Uh, this uh, society still works in that respect. Paul, do we have some online questions? Some of our online viewers here. Is the market having any effect on these institutions? It would seem to me that those wishing to visit historic homes are not the same people who have an abiding interest in critical race theory. Well, I would say there's some indication. The Mount Vernon gets about a million visitors per year, Monticello 500,000, and Montpelier 125,000. So there is some indication that this could be for multiple reasons, but perhaps it's because people are looking to learn about the history in Mount Vernon is doing the best job of the three. Uh, Dana Joya, uh, a former chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, once came to Heritage and gave a presentation here. And he said, conservatives are greatly at fault because conservatives have abdicated the field of history, popular culture, the arts, entertainment, film, etc., to the left. Dana said that we conservatives are so obsessed with the politics of the day, the red meat issues, elections, government, administrative state, the courts, that we've yielded the field to the left to do this colonization of which you speak. Uh, what can be done about this? Well, I certainly tend to agree with that to some degree, that there has been, uh, I was speaking to someone earlier this morning, about the abdication of concern with museum studies. For example, most of the people who are populating these institutions are being prepared in formal programs of museum studies, but those don't show up um, at Hillsdale 
or at many of the other institutions where people are otherwise being trained to enter the field. So one simple solution is simply to get into the business. And that's the implication of your question. And I certainly would support that. Other members of the panel on this? OK. Chris. Hi. Thank you very much. Thank you for your report, Brenda. Um, so I, I completely agree uh, with the, the sense of um, uh, ideological contagion that's rooted in envy and resentment that is colonizing factually and accurately these these areas, uh, and that is that is uh, crazy making. Uh, one of the things that strikes me is that there's sort of a tragedy to this as well, and in, in that what's being lost from from the actual true story of of James Madison, for example, and some of those values. So if I'm a a fifth grade teacher or a fifth grader who recently went to Montpelier or even a tour guide at Montpelier who's not really that informed. What are some of those things that should be said that haven't been said? Can you guys just, I know that's a big question. It's the American founding, but could you speak to some of those, those lost values that, that are not being taught? Yeah, I think on this score too, my question too is, you know, there was a slave owner's constitution on this continent. It was the Confederate constitution. It was explicitly <laughs> written into the text of their constitution. Uh, ours did not have that, and, and, and slavery is not mentioned, even with regard to those three clauses. And progressives, of course, have tried to broaden that to say the entire constitution is tainted by slavery now uh, for quite some time. So I think that's, that's right on. What should we say about our founding and to this claim of a slave owner's constitution also? I think Brenda's really put the finger on this. She says, the, the, the offending institutions are not quoting the founders. They're not telling their story. And, and we have seen a, what we might think is a parallel effort going on at the same time in the country where people are increasingly turning to the primary documents and, and encouraging teachers through curricular programs to teach the primary documents. You cannot subvert human understanding in the face of truth. And so if we are a greatly expanding resort to the primary sources, to what the founders themselves had to say, it will be an inoculation, a vaccine, if you will, against the kind of poisons that are otherwise being injected into the culture. One thing I would add to that is that <clears throat> one effect of the 1619 Project and all the different things we're talking about today is that it has caused a number of historians to go back and start asking these types of questions, including historians who would be conventionally regarded as progressives, mm -hmm. right? So a good example would be someone like Gordon Wood. Yes. So for example, when 1619 Project came out and was making all these different claims about American history, he responded, he and a group of other uh, historians who would not be considered conservatives just responded and said, this is simply not true. There is just factual errors. There is clearly an ideological taint to the way that these things are being produced. So one of the good things, that, if, if you like, as the side effect that's happened is it's causing us to engage, re-engage these questions of the founding, looking at things like primary documents and understanding, coming to a greater understanding of the complexity of these things. History is complicated. It's true. There's, there's truth to history. There's truths we need to revive and bring to the fourth of discussion, but we also need to understand that human beings are complicated yeah. creatures and they make mistakes, they sometimes rationalize things, etc. But the work of good historians is to uncover all that so that we can see the full historical truth of these things as opposed to the mythologies, mm -hmm. whether they are of mythologies of, of the left or even mythologies of the right as well when it comes to the founding and that whole period of time. Um, for the, the fifth grade student or the fifth grade teacher, um, it's probably too heavy a lift to say go read the Federalist Papers, but it's uh, maybe not so heavy a thing to raise the question of how do people govern themselves? What, what is it that sets this apart from my just wanting what I want and taking it versus learning to live with my fellow fifth grade classmates or being able to tell the fifth graders 
let's give some thought as to what a fair way would be to uh, pull ourselves together and govern ourselves. There is the seed of the idea that will lead you to, through the works of Madison, uh, broken down and easily explained. Uh, a, a concept that, as I understand it, is nowhere to be found visiting his presidential house now. Right, Peter, at least take the occasion to say, as someone who reads with great pleasure your wonderful missives, <laughs> I would find the Federalist Papers still more accessible to the fifth grader and the fifth grade teacher <laughs> than your missives. <laughs> but, 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 but I strongly defend the proposition that they can read the Federalist Papers. And of course, I published a book making that argument and encourage teachers all the time to take it up because it, it is really not so inaccessible as people imagine it to be. Uh, so I do want to re underscore that. <laughs> Final question? Perhaps someone already made this. Perhaps someone already made this observation. But to me, the the fundamental filter that that historians nowadays are the main seem to look at things is through the Marxist filter. It's it's one of oppressor and oppressed, which, as we know, that's not reality. We all live with cooperation, not oppression, right? I mean, you don't get through life, most of us, without you know, by oppressing people. So it's a really flawed view of reality that they put onto history. Can I quickly comment yes. on that? So the, the, the classic example of what you're talking about is the, the new history of capitalism, which is, drives the 1619 project. If you look at the references in the New York Times pieces, particularly the one written about the economy, uh, which was written by a sociologist, by the way, interestingly, um, the references that are made uh, to this new history of capitalism, which if you look at the way it analyzes things, the way the authors write, what they say, what they leave in, what they leave out, etc., I can't think of any other way to describe it than as neo-Marxist. And, you know, we're often afraid to say, well, that's, that's where this is coming from. But I think in this case, it's undeniable. I think you're quite right about that. And I, I would add to this something that perhaps we ought to bear in mind in light of your question. Uh, human nature is such that the natural disposition for people is to be at ease, not to be under stress or in tension. It is much easier to be at ease in loving than it is in making war. That is why right. in militaristic cultures it takes a lot of effort to sustain the willingness to fight. It doesn't take a lot of effort to sustain the willingness not to fight. So the underlying human condition, the natural sentiments of human beings are on our side in this regard because these movements are movements designed to prepare people to fight, to work against their nature. And if we remember that, we have the specific that will respond to it. In addition to the economic angle, I would add that we really need to make a choice of a resentment-based approach versus one that is based in gratitude. And, one, and that does not mean that we ignore the shortcomings of the past, but it does mean that we deliberately turn towards the miraculous. And the Constitution is the miracle of Philadelphia. And the Declaration is a stumbling block to tyrants everywhere. And those are our accomplishments as Americans. Those are ours. And there should be a proper sense of pride in those accomplishments and gratitude, not only for this founding generation, but the generations of Americans that came afterwards that moved us towards a fuller realization of those principles. And if you take that away, if you take that proper pride away and that recognition of those accomplishments, all you leave is resentment and grievance. And that is what you are robbing people of. And that sort of approach has never made anyone happy or kind or gracious. So it's an assault not only on the country, but on the individual dignity. Wonderful. Brenda, I think those are fitting remarks to conclude on. We're at the end of our time. <laughs> Thank you for your report, Brenda, Taylor, of Three Presidential Homes, and to the other members of our panel, Bill, Sam, and Peter. Oh. Thank you all for joining us and also for our online audience. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.